today's virtual visit takes us approximately 38 miles east of the Old Colony History Museum, just over the bridge to Cape Cod, to Heritage Museums and Gardens, located in Sandwich, Massachusetts. Jennifer Madden. I'm the Director of Collections and Exhibitions here at Heritage Museums and Gardens. Heritage was founded in 1969, so we're 53 years old this year. We are located on 100 acres of landscape grounds. We have three uh, museum exhibition buildings, including an antique automobile museum, a special exhibitions museum, an art gallery with the working 1908 carousel available for rides, as well as many, many, many uh, specialty gardens uh, and landscape grounds. Uh, Heritage uh, has 18,000 items in our object collections. So that ranges from 42 antique automobiles. We have paintings, sculptures, a collection of American antique firearms, 5,500 American military miniatures, uh, bird carvings, weather vanes, uh, American folk art, a very wide range of items. We are still actively adding to that collection, particularly items that relate to the life, industry, history, culture of southeastern New England. We are standing in our antique automobile museum. The building itself is a reproduction of the round stone dairy barn at uh, what is currently Hancock Shaker Village out in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. When Mr. Lilly was founding the museum, he was very interested in making sure that his museum buildings were reproductions of historic New England structures. Uh, both he and the architect showed up at the meeting where they were to discuss what the automobile gallery would look like with the same book marked to the same page, which was Eric Sloan's An Age of Barnes book. They decided that this um, building would be the perfect uh, setting for the automobiles. So today we have 42 antique cars. Um, we, our exhibit is called From Carriage to Classic. In this exhibit, we look at the cars in chronological order and really uh, talk about what a transformative power the adoption of the automobile was on American society and culture. The carousel was acquired by our founder. The museum was founded uh, by Mr. and Mrs. Josiah K. Lilly III. Uh, they began, um, they purchased this property with the intention of opening a museum in 1967. And one of the first things they acquired, especially for this museum, was the carousel. It was actually here on the Cape. It belonged to a man in Provincetown uh, he wanted to set it up there in his backyard, but the Provincetown uh, Board of Selectmen told him that no, it was too honky-tonk and they did not want it in Provincetown. Uh, so a local auctioneer sort of brokered the sale of the carousel to Mr. Lilly. Liz Fort. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at Heritage Museums and Gardens and uh, this is our working 1908 Leaf Carousel. Um, this is one of the wonderful things that you can take a ride on when you come to visit at Heritage. Um, we opened on the 23rd of April and we'll be open every day 10 to 5 until uh, October 16th. Then we close for the regular season. We um, decorate very quickly for Halloween. We reopen for um, the Halloween festival on the 22nd and 23rd of October in the evening. And then we close again. And then we spend the next four weeks decorating again for the holidays. We string up um, hundreds and thousands of lights all over the gardens and decorate the galleries as well with um, 
close to 50 plus Christmas trees and decorations. And then we reopened for Gardens Aglow, our um, holiday tradition. So the gardens are lit, the galleries are decorated, the carousel's running, you can roast marshmallows, visit with Santa. Uh, it's really fun and that runs um, Thursdays through Sundays in the evening, um, as well as the days leading up right before Christmas. Some other programs that are happening during the regular season. So we always have our signature horticulture festivals. Our first one is coming up in May. That's the Rhododendron Festival, where we have thousands of rhododendrons in bloom. You literally get to walk through like mountains of flowers all around you. Um, it's really, really impressive here. Um, Heritage is known for its collection of rhododendrons. And um, before the museum was here, uh, Charles Owen Dexter, who was a famous um, horticulturalist, was here doing a lot of hybridizing of rhododendrons and thus we have the great collection here. Then our next major horticultural festival is the Hydrangea Festival. So Cape Cod, the whole um, peninsula is known for the Hydrangea Festival and we participate in that as well. That runs in the beginning of July, starting July 8th um, for 10 days and all of our signature hydrangeas are in bloom. Um, and we do some programming as well for those um, festivals. So if you come and visit, you can pick up a self guide. There's a family activity guide. Um, and it's just really a special week here on Cape Cod, um, as well as um, at Heritage. Um, some of our other major events, June 11th is our annual auto show. So this year we're celebrating our 50th anniversary of the auto show. Um, so it's gonna be a really big deal. The auto show is usually our most well attended day for the whole season. Um, about 150 cars will be here on display. Um, anything from early 1910s kind of vehicles all the way up until the flashiest um, 2021 cars might be here, um, or your minivan could come into the show as well. Um, any kind of car is welcome at that show. It's a really fun family day. Um, we give out awards, it's just a big big time. Uh, you can learn all about our programming, these things I've talked about, as well as um, many, many more. We have about 100 plus days of programming this year. Um, all of that information can be found on our calendar, which is on our website at heritagemuseums.org. selected as the main industry for the Cape that actually happened about a hundred years ago. What tourists did when they got here and then what are the challenges that are created for Cape Cod by uh, the tourism industry being our main economic driver. We have been talking about hosting this exhibition for 16 years. I was inspired by a book that was released in 2003 by James O'Connell called Becoming Cape Cod. And uh, after I read that book, I knew that Heritage would be a uh, great place to host that exhibit uh, because our collections have a lot to do with Cape Cod, obviously, and because the automobile was so transformative and so important to the Cape Cod vacation. Obviously, we have an auto museum, so we're able to work that part into the exhibit as well. David Thoreau's uh, walking tours of the Cape leading up to the publication of his book Cape Cod. We also talk about very early tourism to the Cape in the form of early hunting and fishing trips to the Cape, mostly by urban wealthy men. Also the uh, religious meeting groups, uh, camp meetings that were happening here on the Cape, mostly Methodist but other uh, denominations as well. 
um, had early gatherings here, especially after the arrival of the railroad on the Cape in 1848, made that much easier for them to get here. only train that ran um, from Cape Cod to Boston. So the subscribers were wealthy businessmen with homes between Wareham and Woods Hole on the Cape. And of course they wanted to enjoy their Cape houses during the summer, but they also had to be at work in Boston. So they could, um, the train would leave from Woods Hole and make stops at stations all the way up to Wareham, picking up all these businessmen. And then it ran express from Wareham to Boston's Neelan Street Station. So everybody could get to Boston by 9.30 in the morning. They left again at 3.20 in the afternoon and everybody could be home again in time for dinner. In the uh, railroad employees timetables, this was called a private express train. It was never called the Dude Train in any official publications. That was its nickname. A dude at the time um, was considered to be a fashionable gentleman. And so since the, that could describe the subscribers to the train, the nickname for the train was the Dude Train. hotels for the duration of the summer with husbands and fathers going as they were able. At, that, at this point, a big draw of coming to the Cape for a summer vacation was its uh, lure as a healthy destination to come. If you were living in cities at, in the late 1800s, um, they are often full of disease in the summertime. If you could afford to remove your family and your children from those conditions, you certainly did so. The Cape was a healthy place, seen as a healthy place to come. stuck at that tourist hotel all summer, but instead be driving around the Cape and experience it as they would like to. So we talk about the places that tourists were going and what they were doing. So we have a section on entertainment venues, so uh, playhouses and music performance, uh, a section on Provincetown. Most people think a trip to the Cape might not be complete if you didn't go to Provincetown. 
uh, section on summer camps as a way that many people, particularly children, are introduced to the Cape and then later end up buying summer houses here. Uh, section on roadside attractions. So when tourists were driving around, where were they stopping and what were they doing? So for example, uh, amusement parks, museums, uh, shops like bird carver shops, carving um, whirly gigs, that sort of thing. We have a whole section on souvenirs. What were they buying and taking home with them while they were here? What kind of sports were they doing? What kind of lodging were they staying in? Where were they eating? Uh, we have an opportunity for people to play uh, mini golf in the gallery as well. included in the exhibit some examples of early uh, bathing suits. In the late 1800s up to say 1900 or so, people weren't really swimming the way we're thinking of swimming today. It was um, what was called at that point sea bathing. So uh, this was something that was considered good for your health. You would sort of soak in the water but not do any vigorous swimming. Of course, the materials that we make bathing suits out of today had not been invented yet. So bathing suits were made out of wool, this one is wool, or cotton. Uh, that seems uncomfortable to us uh, today, um, but at the time, wool would have kept the wearer very warm um, in cold water. Cotton would dry uh, faster than wool. So these were the two um, main types. Now in the late 1800s especially, women would not have been allowed to expose very much skin. So um, before this sort of bathing costume, before that, women would have worn uh, long sleeves and long dresses and bloomers and hose and sometimes even shoes. We have an example of bathing slippers um, here. So very cumbersome outfits that wouldn't have permitted that kind of vigorous swimming that we do today. As time went on and uh, fabrics improved for swimming suits and people started actually swimming when they went to the beach. Swimsuits changed, no longer really called bathing suits but now swimming suits and uh, were much more compatible for that type of activity. This swimming suit I really love and as soon as I saw it, this is on loan to us from the University of Rhode Island, historic uh, costume and textile collection. I knew I had to have it. Uh, the pattern here in the fabric is uh, stick figure angels and devils wearing barrels dancing with each other. So we talk, We started here about 1960 up to the present, talking about the development pressures that are created by a tourist economy and what kind of challenges those present to the Cape. So we actually start with a uh, booklet that was published in 1956 called Does Cape Cod Figure in Your Future? But one of the pages in that book says, which way is the Cape going? And talks about a number of challenges seen to the Cape at that point in 1956. Okay, spoiler alert, almost 70 years later, we're still talking about a lot of these same issues. So we have chosen four of the issues from that booklet and then sort of expanded them to talk about those challenges for the Cape um, today. 
So the first is uh, water quality on the Cape. We know that most of the sewage on the Cape is treated through septic systems instead of sewers. That creates a lot of um, surface water pollution with nitrogen, which creates all kinds of problems um, with our, with algae blooms um, and pond water quality and estuary water quality. So we talk about that here. What is the issue? What's being done to address it currently? So we include a success story for all of these. And then what individuals can do uh, to uh, their own homes or in their own activities to uh, help this situation. And then each section has at least one QR code, sometimes more, uh, to talk about how people can learn more about uh, that particular issue. Second one is housing, because so many people want to come here either on vacation or live here, or turn their summer homes into year-round homes, or you know, there's a lot of different scenarios here. What has happened is that the price of a median single-family house on Cape Cod is over $600,000. That means you need a, a household income of $170,000 to afford a house here on the Cape. So households with two working professionals are finding it difficult to afford to live here, uh, let alone the folks who are uh, serving tables and making our tourist economy work. So we talk about that issue. Uh, we're also talking about uh, regional character. What are the things about the Cape that draw people here um, so, such as its beautiful location, its historic nature, and how are we going to protect those item, those areas from uh, development pressure uh, to build more big trophy homes or whatever. So we talk about historic preservation on this side and on the other side talk about land conservation and specifically the establishment of the Cape Cod National Seashore in uh, 1961 and actually on loan to us from the Park, National Park Service is a pen that JFK used to sign the National Seashore Legislation uh, into law. And at the end, we are talking about what happens to all of Cape Cod's trash, uh, all, obviously from our year-round population, but also from our seasonal population and how we can uh, work to reduce that. change is impacting uh, the Cape and the Cape's tourism infrastructure. So um, people can see an example actually of a painting from our collection that was commissioned um, from a man who noticed changes in development on the Cape and he wanted to document the Cape before that development um, was evident but also before the changes that we know of now as um, climate change were evident on the Cape. Uh, we've included a special section here about the impact to the town of Sandwich. We actually worked with them and the town got a grant and then provided us some funding to talk specifically about uh, the impact of coastal storms to Sandwich beaches um, and the increasing frequency and intensity of those storms and what that's meaning for our dune erosion, uh, which is a big problem here in Sandwich and flooding because our dunes have eroded that the flooding that comes with those storms reaches further inland than it has in the past. Uh, we have included here a kiosk with the Cape Cod Sea Level Rise Viewer, which is a uh, program that the Cape Cod Commission um, has available online for anybody to look at. So you can zoom way in and uh, any spot on the Cape and look at uh, what it is what it would look like at that spot for one foot up to six feet of sea level rise. 
and then also see what would happen if, say, you're at three feet of sea level rise and then a category four storm comes in and pushes a, a whole bunch more water, what would that mean for any particular area as far as flooding goes? And then at the end, what can we all do about climate change? Um, what are the issues on the Cape? Transportation is uh, providing most of our emissions. Uh, I think it is, yes, 55% of our emissions are coming from personal vehicles. And of course, the Cape draws 5 million people a year if all of those people are driving their own cars and all of that emission. What can we do about that? And since um, it's tempting to sort of ignore climate change and pretend it doesn't exist and don't really think about it, there are real costs to doing nothing. So we're talking about that as well. Um, it's the success story here is the um, approval right now of some of the wind uh, farms south of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. And then what you can do, we have uh, some actions here that individuals can take as well as some ways to learn more. Creating Cape Cod exhibit, we have included some vehicles since the automobile was so transformative to the nature of a Cape Cod vacation. So we have included two vehicles from our own collection, a 1946 Mercury Woody Wagon, which of course they were used exclusively, uh, extensively on the beach for uh, fishing, surfing, you can put a whole bunch of people and fishing gear and all that stuff in there. Uh, we also have a 1965 Ford Country Squire station wagon with the faux wood sides. This is, you know, most people, not most people, many people have a memory of traveling uh, family vacations in a car such as this one. We have also borrowed from the Cape Cod Maritime Museum a 1932 Beetle cat boat. Uh, which of course was made in New Bedford, and um, this one was used exclusively in Barnstable Harbor during its lifetime. We have also included a 1929 Packard uh, runabout pulling a 1930 Curtis Aero Car camper. Both of these vehicles are what we call barn finds in that they have not been uh, extensively restored like some of the other vehicles in our collection. Uh, we know, of course, that there were many, many early campgrounds here on the Cape, and vehicles like this uh, would have been used to enjoy a Cape Cod vacation as well.